who I am. I'm Eric, the founding pastor here. And it's been a while since I spoke because we did all five of these guys. And again, I want to welcome those that are online. I just love living in this city. Don't you? Go, we live in a blessed city, don't we? <laughs> South Walton, not so much, but Destin. <laughs> I'll change that as soon as they can get that stupid construction done on 98. You know what I'm saying? Like, if it, I guess we could tell Walton County jokes. I mean, how many years does it take Walton County to build a highway? You know, that kind of stuff. So anyway, one of the things I love about this city is that for over 60 years, we've been doing this thing called the Blessing of the Fleet. You guys been to that? Well, and everyone who comes and visits our city says, ah, that's amazing. And if you've never attended it, I encourage you to attend it. It's on Ascension Day, which is 40 days after Easter. That's the day Jesus rose, which means it's always changing. So I actually didn't get to do it this year because I had a wedding scheduled. And that's what happens to a lot of boat captains is they'll put a trip down a year in advance, and then they don't realize it's the day of the blessing of the fleet. If you don't know what the blessing of the fleet is, for 60 years, over 60 years, the city and the clergy in the city have been gathering on the docks, and we bless all of those who make their living from the sea. And all the churches come together in unity. It's a really powerful thing that, that happens here in the city and just tells you, the blessings of God that are on this city. And uh, I, like I said, I didn't get to do it. In fact, I remember one year, um, somebody was renting a slip from me, and they'd done the same thing. They booked a trip, didn't realize it was the blessing of the fleet, and so they missed the blessing of the fleet. And I'd come back to my house, and they were washing their boat down, and I said, oh, you guys missed it. And they said, yeah, we were so bummed when we realized it was the same day. And I said, I hope nothing bad happens to you this year. <laughs> And they were like, don't say that. We were just saying the same thing. And I said, luckily for you, you have a personal pastor that will bless your boat this morning or this evening. And so that's what I did. So, and it's funny because um, that, you know, semen, you know, not, I said, um, people, you guys are horrible. That is, I, I'm, I can't even speak. I'm the Klimt. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> what I'm saying is that it's amazing how people who work on boats can be superstitious, right? You know, like this whole thing about bananas. You can't bring a banana on a boat. Why? Well, 24 years ago, our boat was struck by lightning, and we looked, and we had a banana on the boat. Now, that's not the reason that they, bananas are super, you know what's really ironic is that I come from a sailing background and sailors don't have that superstition about bananas, but fishermen do. It's so weird. So there's these superstitions that surround all kinds of life that get to us. And you know, that's the thing is that when you're in church, superstitions can work their way into church too. We do a lot of things in church, mostly from traditions that we don't even know where they come from. And then we get superstitions about them, like crossing yourself, you know, I'm not, I'm not knocking Catholic religion who do that. I'm just saying become a superstition or thinking that the reason why we got into a car accident was because we forgot to pray a hedge of protection over us before we left the house. You know what I'm saying? I mean, Christians, let's just admit it. Christians can be weird and crazy and wacky, <laughs> right? I was, by, I, was, I was somewhere one time and there was a guy who was talking to me about a car he wanted to buy. It was a Dodge. I can't remember which one it was. And he wanted the red, but he was a Christian and he couldn't buy the red because in the brochure it was called the Diablo Red. Diablo is Spanish for the devil. Christian can't have a car that has Diablo Red color on it, okay? You know what I'm saying? Come on. Remember going to a church picnic? Anybody been to a church picnic? Say, I'll take a deviled egg. Bless your heart. We don't call them deviled eggs. We call them angel eggs, right? <laughs> and they always got bless your heart, you know. Bless your heart. We don't celebrate hallelujah. We celebrate, hol I mean, oh man, I messed up that joke. <laughs> we don't celebrate Halloween. We celebrate hallelujah night, right? So there's a lot of conflict that happens in church that's based really on traditions and beliefs that can become superstitious, like, have you ever got into an argument with someone about the version of the Bible that you read? You know, I was talking to a guy one time, and he said, here's what he said, well, I only read King James, because if it was good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. <laughs> um, so some of you guys who understand the Bible get that. Others are like, oh, Paul read the King James. That makes sense. <laughs> no, he didn't read the King James. You know, we had a friend of the family, and they had a young child. I mean, he was probably two or three, a little boy, and the grandparents were over at the house, and the, the, the boy, little boy, was climbing up on the couch, and my friend, the dad said, get down off the couch, you little monkey. And his parents, the grandparents said, you shouldn't call him that. There's power in your words. And I'm like, 
do you actually believe that this kid is going to turn into a monkey if I keep calling him a monkey? I mean, it sounds silly, right? And I get it. We should be careful what we speak. You know, if you speak something negative over your child, it'll, I mean, it can happen. Jesus, uh, James says you'll have the words that you speak. Jesus said the same thing. I get that. But what point does it become meaningless superstition like Stevie Wonder said to you, believe in the things that you don't understand? Which is why the subject that I want to talk about today is very interesting because there are people in church who don't care about church, don't have care about God, but yet have a strong opinion about this subject. In fact, this subject can be so emotional, what we're talking about is baptism, that it brings up a lot of questions. In fact, we got a call one time at the church and this is, I happened to answer the phone back when we had a phone. So if you ever tried to call the church, you know that we don't even have a phone here. Someone says, I tried to call the church. I was like, I didn't know we had a number because we don't. This, who has phones anymore, right? Here's my phone, right? You guys you want to get old me? You know my number. And if you don't know my m- number, there's a reason. Anyway, um, <laughs> she, they called and said, oh, do, will you baptize our baby? I was like, well, okay, hold on. Let me ask you a few questions. First of all, um, who are you? you know, are you in church? And they're like, no, we're not in church. So you don't attend a church? No. I said, do, do, do you, are you a, would you call yourself a Christ follower? No, not really. So you don't attend church, you don't really follow God, but you want me to take your baby and stick it underwater or maybe sprinkle water on it. Yeah, that's right. Why? Because it becomes this superstition. So a lot of people have questions about baptisms, like who should be baptized? Can a couple be baptized? And I think yes, only as you're only if you're sitting in the tubs like the Cialis commercial, you know, where you're on a front porch <laughs> taking the bath together, then yes, as a couple you can be baptized together. Who does that? (laughs) Hey, baby, I found a place for us to go for the weekend, and they got double tubs on the front porch where we can take a bath. Okay, anyway, sorry. I'm digressing. (laughs) But what about my children? Can my kids be baptized? Can babies be baptized? When should someone be baptized? Why are people baptized? In fact, what is baptism, and where does it come from? Most of the time, your view on baptism is determined by how you were raised. In fact, if you were raised as one of those people that maybe you were baptized as a baby, somebody, a Catholic priest or a priest sprinkled water over you, and that's what you believe, that as, ba- you know, as, as babies should be baptized right away. Or maybe when you were younger, as a kid, you got baptized, or as a student at summer camp, a teenager, whatever, you got baptized, and then like a lot of people, when you became a young adult, you kind of walked away from God, and you walked away from the church, and now you're back, you're in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, whatever, and you're thinking, should I be baptized? And then there's just this uh, confusion, especially if you didn't grow up in church, you don't maybe understand baptism because it can kind of seem like this ancient ritual from thousands of years ago. You know, there's this confusion about it. Does Shoreline baptize? Surely Shoreline doesn't do it because they're a modern, cool, hip church in a nightclub, you know, because your perception of baptism might be, you know, something from like, uh, brother, where art thou? We're going down to the river to pray. You know, we're going to dump. Come on in, boys. The water's fine. So if you've ever had those questions, you're not alone, especially this add to this confusion that when you walk into church, there's this idea without explaining that if I just dunk myself out or someone dunks me into a a, a bathtub of water or a pool of water, I'm going to come up a new person. And so if you've ever thought that, you're actually not alone. In fact, thousands of years That's kind of been that perception with not just Christianity, but even other religions and philosophies have all sort of incorporated some kind of what we have now termed baptism when it comes to their followers. So, of course, when people begin to adopt Christianity throughout Asia and Europe, around the Mediterranean, some of those superstitions, some of those beliefs, some of those rituals began to kind of creep into the Christian church and creep into the Christian beliefs as well. And it was no different at the church of Corinth. And that's what we're looking at today. We're going to finish our series straight out of Corinth, where we've been looking at letters that the apostle Paul wrote 2,000 years ago that really changed culture and actually affected the whole world. Now, if you're not familiar, Corinth is actually a city. It's a real city located in where Greece is. And what we've found as we've been looking for the last five weeks, five or six weeks, is that some of the things that the Apostle Paul deals with in these letters that he wrote to this specific church in the city of Corinth are very applicable and actually relevant for us today. Because some of the traditions and practices from their pagan culture, which happens. In fact, someone might think that 
we do the same thing because we played a song by Stevie Wonder, right? That, oh, they've brought in pagan traditions or, or tr you know, cultural traditions into the church. But some of those things started to creep their way into the church. And we've been talking about that in this series as well as the last one we did called Legalize It. And if you didn't see Legalize It, I encourage you to get online, maybe binge watch it like you do your you know, Netflix and watch the whole thing. Because there we talk about weed, we talk about alcohol, and we talk about sex. Because one of the biggest questions we're getting right now is, is it okay as weed becomes legal? Is it for okay? for Christians to smoke weed. And if you've ever had that question, you should watch that series. And what we've been looking at is in the city of Corinth is that Paul deal, deals with some of these things. Like if you remember from your world religions class, if you took world religions in high school or college and you studied the Greek religion, the mythology, one of the goddesses they worshiped was the goddess Aphrodite, which is where we get the word aphrodisiac, right? She was the goddess of sex. So part of their worship in that it was included sex, okay? So because of their liberal view of sex outside of marriage, it be, that kind of, it was, it was messing up their relationships in the church. Pa Paul has to deal with that. So we looked at that. Um, this worship, this culture also, when it came to worship, included intoxication. I mean, there was parts of their worship involved being intoxicated, whether it was alcohol or some other kind of stimulant. And so when some of these Christ followers began to, or some of these people in Greece and Corinth began to follow Jesus, uh, when it came time to the communion service, people were getting drunk. And Pastor Darlene talked about that. If you were here for that, people were getting drunk. Um, their worship services were super crazy and chaotic. There would be no order. You know, people would just be praying in tongues all over the room and Paul has to come in and address that. Another area that Paul addresses is some of the problems that created some confusion around baptism. In fact, their misunderstanding about baptism was actually causing a division in the church. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Now, the Apostle Paul, if you, we're going to have some scriptures, we're going to have some points. If you have not downloaded our app, if you're online, you want to download our app, uh, just, this is just a friendly reminder to turn your phone on silent right now. And while you're on it, why don't you get on social media and invite somebody to be here for our 11 o'clock service. Plus, we still have church at Crab Island. So if they're out on the boat, and they're like, hey, we're on the boat. Oh, we got church at Crab Island, 10 o'clock. Still make that. So some of the, one of, the Apostle Paul mentions baptism in the letters to the Corinthians twice. And in the first chapter, chapter 1, that's the first time he mentions it, that's when he's dealing with these divisions. And what's happening is people are kind of drawing up into camps. Okay, they, they, somehow there's a disagreement and people are going, well, you know what? I'm a follower of Peter. Well, I'm a follower of apostle. I mean, apostle, Apollos. Okay, I'm a follower of Paul. All right. And Paul answers this question starting in verse 13. And here's what he says. He says, has Christ been divided into factions? Now, if you didn't know what he was talking about, you think, what does that mean? Is he talking about Jesus' body being divided, his physical body? Not really. Now, Jesus' physical body was beaten, it was bruised, it was bloodied, it was crucified, all of those things, but it wasn't divided. In other words, it wasn't like what they used to do like in England and France in the 1800s or 1700s where they would draw and quarter, you know what that is? Where they'd actually divide the parts of your body. He's not talking about that. And besides, if he was talking about that, he wouldn't say it was drawn into factions, because what are factions? F factions are small, organized groups within a larger group. So the factions that the Apostle Paul is addressing is these groups, these factions that have organized around specific leaders in this church, like Paul and Peter and Apollos, okay? And so when he says, is Christ divided, he's not talking about Christ's physical body. He's actually talking about the church. Now, Paul often referred to the church as what? The body of Christ, okay? Okay. And this is a term that he, we're going to look at a little bit later on, okay? And here's what he does. Paul, Paul compares our physical body to the body of Christ, okay? He says, and actually, there's a lot of comparisons. I mean, there's a lot of similarities that the body of Christ, all of us, corporately, we make up the body of Christ. And just like your physical body has these characteristics, those same characteristics happen in the body of Christ. For example, he says, you know, the hand can never say to the foot, well, you know what? I'm not a foot, so I must not be part of the body. Just like you can't do, well, I'm not a pastor, so I'm not a, an evangel I'm not a missionary, so I must not be part of the, I must not be important. Paul says that you may think that, but that's not true. You're still part of the body. And that means you have a job to do. He says, same with the ears and the eyes. The ear can't say, I wish I was an eye. Well, you might, but it doesn't matter. You're still part of the body and you still have a function. 
and he, and, he, and he compares it to the body like this. He says, if the whole body was an eye, how strange would that look? You know, like Monsters, Inc., right? This one big eye. He goes, that would look ridiculous. You can't be that way, he says. And the way your parts of the body, your parts of the body can't go, you know what? We don't need you. Well, my hand can't say to my knee, I don't need you, or I don't need my appendix. I don't need you anymore. He says, we can't do, we can't do, the, we can't do that either. As the body of Christ, we can't say to someone else, well, we don't need you. And so Paul compares what we're doing as, as a body. So when Paul says, is Christ divided, he's using a physical analogy of the church. And so what he's saying is, look, Jesus' physical body wasn't divided. So why are you dividing his physical representation on the earth, the church? Because that's what we are. When he talks about the body of Christ, we are as close to Jesus as people will get. You go, well, that's pretty far away. Yeah, that's why we want to change some of that, okay? But he says, if Christ's physical body wasn't divided, why are you dividing the body of Christ by create, forming these factions around leaders in the church? And then he goes on and asks a couple of, I, you know, if you, Paul was pretty sarcastic in some of his letters. If you've ever read Paul's letters, Sometimes what we do is breeze by him. But if you really look into him and think about it, some of his questions are sarcastic. And I think the next couple of ones are. Like this one, verse 13. He says, was I, Paul, crucified for you? To which we go, no, no, you weren't. Of course I wasn't. He says, was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. Were you? No. No, you weren't, Right? Whose name were you baptized in? The name of Jesus. What? The name of Jesus. Okay, right, the name of Jesus. And then he says something that if you're a Bible reader, any Bible readers in here? All right. <laughs> if you're a Bible reader, you probably kind of just breeze by this and don't really think about what he's talking about. Because in our culture, the context, we don't understand this, but they would recognize it because it was significant. Signif it was important to them, all right? <laughs> And it was probably the cause of their divisions, because look what he says in verse 14. I thank God that I did not baptize any of you, except Crispus, who had a fried chicken franchise, and Gaius, I'm not sure what he did, for now no one can say, listen, no one can say they were baptized in my name. Oh, yes. Like he suddenly remembers, wouldn't you just kind of erase what you just wrote? He says, oh, yes, I also baptized the house of Stephanus but I don't remember baptizing anyone else. The question is, why was he glad that he didn't baptize other people? Why did he have to remind them that they weren't baptized in his name? I do a lot of baptisms and I never have to say, now remember, you're not being baptized in the name of Eric, you're being baptized in the name of Jesus, okay. So to answer this question, we kind of got to go back in time, go back in history with Mr. Peabody and Sherman and, and discover the history of baptism, okay? So we're going to do that. So say you live in Jerusalem in the time that Jesus was born, right? And you want to convert to Judaism. And so you go down to the, maybe you're a Greek guy and you, live in, you happen to live in Jerusalem and you want to convert. So you go down to the temple and you ask a priest, hey, I'm obviously not Jewish. What would it take for me to convert to Judaism? And the priest would tell you, well, you got to do a couple of things. And okay, what are they? And he says, well, I'm going to start with the hard one first, because after I do this one, I never get to the rest of them. You have to be circumcised. And if you're still interested, um, you have to submit to the law of Moses, which meant there was some memorization, some reading of the law of Moses. But really what you were doing was making a commitment to keep the law, the seventh, the 10 commandments, all of their, their cleanliness laws, all those things. Okay. And then you would, have to, you would have to do a covenant meal, which would be similar to our communion. You have to take a meal that say that you're going in covenant with, the, with God, the God of Israel. You have to make a sacrifice at the temple as a Gentile. And then lastly, he would say, you would have to wash yourself. All right. Now, uh, in Acts chapter 21, Paul, before he's arrested, some of you remember this, he goes back to Jerusalem, okay? And if you're not a Bible reader, here's what happens. The Apostle Paul, who wrote this letter that we're looking at, okay? He used to be a Jewish religious leader, has this conversion, meets Jesus, becomes the biggest cheerleader for this Christian movement called The Way. And he begins to go out, what we call a missionary journeys, around the Mediterranean and start churches. That's where he started this church at Corinth. 
After his third missionary journey, he comes back to Jerusalem and he's meeting with the elders of the church in Jerusalem, including the pastor, which is, his name is James, and he's the half-brother of Jesus. And they tell him, listen, there are some Jewish followers. So there were Jewish people who were converting to Christianity, but they're upset because they hear rumors, Paul, that you're telling the Jews out in Greece and Rome and all these other places that convert to Christianity or become Christ followers that they don't have to keep the law anymore. In other words, so they're upset because what would happen is the Jewish people would just basically keep on keeping the law and they'd add Jesus to their kind of repertoire, all right? But the people who weren't Jewish, Paul would just tell them, you know. So they're, te- they're afraid. They're hearing rumors that you're telling Jewish people they don't have to keep the law. So here's the plan. Here's what we want to do. We have four Gentiles. Gentiles are non-Jewish people who are converting. So tomorrow, why don't you go with them to the temple and everyone will see and know that this isn't true. And this is what it says that happened. It says, so Paul went to the temple with the other men. They had already started the purification ritual. That's those five things that I just mentioned, including the washing. So he publicly announced the date when their vows would end and the sacrifices there, that is, would be offered for each of them. So if you wanted to become Jewish, there was five things you had to do. And one of them was washing yourself. Okay. Now, in front of the temple, the big temple they have, you can go there today and see it. If you go to Israel, go to Jerusalem, they've excavated, and they have these big, almost like big hot tubs. Got a hot tub, going in the hot tub. Big, big tubs they've excavated, and that you would actually, when you were cleansing yourself, and there was many times in the Jewish religion when you need to be ceremonially clean, like after you had a baby, touched a dead body, you'd have to go through this purification ritual. At the end of the purification ritual, you'd actually walk down into this big thing, this vat of water, and you would come out and be ceremonially clean. Now, when it comes to converting to Judaism, that's what you did. That was one of the steps, was you were walking down into the tub, and you were washing away your Gentileness, and you were in, by coming out, you were embracing the new teachings and doctrine and way of life as a Jewish people, Jewish person. So you see that. This is what he tells you you're doing. You leave there. On your way home, you're passing by the Jordan River, and you see this guy out in the river, and he's wearing camel skins, and he looks like a homeless guy, and he's out standing in his waist to the water, and he's yelling at people on the bank, repent from your sins, turn to God, and be baptized. Now, he's not using the word baptism, though, okay? He's just saying, be dunked in the water, be washed, because that's actually what that word means. In fact, that caused some confusion in the 1400s when they translated the Bible over to English. They were looking for this word because the Greek word is baptizo, and you know what it means? It means to be washed or dunked or dipped into water. But when the people were translating the Bible to English, they were like, you know, that word doesn't sound religious enough. Hey, you know, be washed and of your sins or, you know, so they took the Greek word and made an English word out of it. That's actually part of the confusion. So when John the Baptist is saying, hey, repent from your sins, turn to God and come down and be washed or be dunked. They're not thinking baptism. They're just thinking being dipped in the water. And you know what's happening because you just discussed with the Jewish priest and you've seen this before. That what these people are doing is they are identifying with John's message. I am repenting. I'm turning back to God and my old way, and they're basically identifying by going down into the water and saying, my old way of life is done, and I am now associating myself with this new message that I have turned my back on my old life, and I've embraced this teaching of repenting and turning of my sins and turning towards God. That's John the Baptist. Now, years later, not even years later, after John is, is executed, John the Baptist is actually executed by Herod. And so his, his disciples, they scatter. Years later, maybe 20 years later, the apostle Paul is traveling through the Mediterranean and he runs into some disciples of John the Baptist. Look at this in Acts chapter 19. While Apollos was in Corinth. So remember Apollos, he got these factions. I'm of Apollos, I'm of Peter, I'm of Paul. While Apollos is at the church in Corinth, that's where we're at, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus, another city in Greece on the coast. Oh, on the coast. There it is. Where he found several believers. And he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they replied. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. 
So Paul's like, then what baptism did you experience? And they answered, the baptism of John. And Paul goes, oh, John's baptism called for a repentance of, from sin. But John himself told people to believe in the one who would come. Who's that? Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. So first they were baptized, aligning themselves with the message of John. But then, and what was John's message? There's someone else coming. Who was it? Jesus. Now they hear that message, so they get baptized again. They get dunked under the water. What are they doing and now? Now they are aligning themselves with the message of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Even in the Greek culture, this was a common practice. In fact, the Greeks considered themselves intellectuals. So when, and they loved hearing new philosophies. They loved hearing about new ways, new ideas. So this idea that Paul would come to Athens and start talking about Jesus, that they would be offended. No, they were like, actually, they go, hey, we want to hear more about what you're talking about. In Acts chapter 17, they actually take him down to the Aerogrippa, the big arena there in Athens, and they say, tell us more of this, okay? And so what was very common in the Greek culture for a philosopher or someone spousing a new way to begin to amass a group of followers or what we call disciples, and what they would do is do that. They would actually dip themselves in water. Most of the time, you didn't have a person doing it. You just did it yourself. And what you were saying is, I am publicly aligning myself with this message or this new philosophy or this new way. Now, let's go back to Corinth. You have these new converts to Christianity who've come from a culture that this is common practice. In fact, it's common practice around the world where you wash yourself or you dip yourself in water as a symbolic gesture of following this new way of life or teaching or philosophy from, from Judaism to John the Baptist to, to even a Greek philosopher. So now you have these new converts and then you have these Christ followers, Apollos, Peter, Paul, who take Jesus' commission very seriously, what was Jesus' commission? The last thing he said before he ascended into heaven, he said, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, look at this, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the Son, not in the name of Peter, not in the name of Paul, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So they get to a place like Corinth, and they tell, people about the, they tell people about the message of Jesus, who they receive it. Again, they weren't offended because they loved hearing new, they considered themselves intellectuals and they loved to hear about these new philosophies, okay? But because of their background, it begins to create divisions in the church. Because maybe they come into agreement and go, we want purple shag carpeting. We want blue shag carpeting. And they go, well, that's Peter. He likes blue. The apostle Paul likes purple. Well, I follow Apollos. And Paulo says, No. Was Peter crucified for you? No. Was I? Was Apollos? No. And then he tells us what it means to be baptized in the name of Jesus. No matter who did it, whether it was a pastor when you were 60 years old or it was your dad when you were six, go to 1 Corinthians 12 and he talks to us about what it means to be baptized. He says, the human body has many parts. So here he is. Remember what we talked about? Comparing the body of Christ to the human body. He says, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up the whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. So he's comparing the human body, right, to the church or the body of Christ. He says, some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free. In other words, what he's saying is the body of Christ is diverse. It's made up of many different nationalities, ethnic, ethnic groups, um, people from different stages of life, people from different classes of life. In fact, it, let me put it this way. If you don't like black people, you ain't going to like heaven. You don't like white people, you ain't going to like heaven. You don't like rich people, poor people, you don't like white, black, young, old, you're not going to like heaven. Brown people, you're not going to like heaven. I just love that part. It says, some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are, that was free, some are slaves, and some are free. Look at this. But we've all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Unlike being baptized as a follower of a philosopher or a teacher of a certain way, he says we've all been baptized into the body of Christ. So what does that mean? 
Baptism is not only aligning ourselves with the teachings of Jesus. Because remember what it, what it took to be Jewish? What did it take to be Jewish? One of them was you have to submit yourself to the law of Moses, okay? As Christ followers, as Christ followers, when we're baptized in the name of Jesus, you know what we're doing? Is we're submitting ourselves not to the law of Moses, but to the law of Christ. Amen. Anyone know what the law of Christ is? On the night he was betrayed, Jesus says, I'm giving you a new commandment, which would be blasphemy unless you wrote the first 10 commandments, right? And he's not saying, I'm giving you additional commandments. In other words, I want you to keep these 10 plus this one. He's saying, I'm giving you a new commandment because we're under a new covenant. You don't, it's, the other ones are gone. Here's the new commandment. As I have loved you, that's how I want you to love others. That's the new commandment. That's the law of Christ. As I have loved you, that's how I want you to love others. How did he love us? Unconditionally and without judgment. That's how we're to love others. And so when we're baptized into the name of Jesus, we are submitting ourselves to the law of Christ, that we are going to love others the way Christ loved us. The other thing we're doing is we are identifying with the, resurrect, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Paul explains it this way in Romans, the book of Romans. I don't have time to go there, but here's what he says. That when we're buried with him in baptism, in other words, when we go under the water, it signifies the old me, my old way of life has now passed away. It's gone. It's being buried. And that when I come up out of the water, it signifies a new me being raised in new life, just like Jesus' resurrection. Okay. In fact, here's how I like to say it. Baptism is like a wedding ring. Okay. My wedding ring doesn't make, I'm not married because I have a wedding ring. My wedding ring signifies that I'm married. I just did a wedding yesterday, and one of the things I say about the rings during the wedding is that this, these rings are an outward sign of the inward covenant that you're coming into agreement, that you're making here today. Baptism is the outward sign of the inward covenant that you're entering into with God by way of Christ's death and resurrection. So here's what this means. Baptism is a public declaration of a new association. Baptism is a public declaration of that I am not only aligning myself with the teachings of Jesus, I'm aligning myself with the resurrection of Jesus. I'm receiving the forgiveness that he made for me by way of the cross, and I'm aligning myself. So here's what that means. Baptism is for those who've made a decision to publicly follow Jesus. So if you've ever wondered, should I be baptized? Baptism is for those who've made a decision to publicly follow Jesus. So if you've never been washed, right, since you believe, never been dunked, never been dipped or baptized, then you should be baptized. If you were baptized as a baby or a, a child and you didn't know what it meant, then you should be baptized. If you were baptized as a teenager or a young adult and then kind of dropped off the faith and now you're back, then you should be baptized. Now, here's the thing I want to challenge you with. Every time we do a baptism at the beach or Crab Island, you know what? Something inevitably happens. Someone will see us doing what we're doing. They'll come up there. Maybe they're emotionally moved from when they were a child or a teenager and gave their heart to life or to God at summer camp. And they'll go, will you baptize me? And we don't know who they are. And we baptize them. And most of the times, we never see them again. But here's what I want to challenge you with this morning. Let's go back to verse 13 again. We're going to close with this. He says, we've all been baptized into one body by one spirit. One thing that we all share, if you have been baptized in the name of Jesus, that we all share with believers across the world as well as across generations of time. That's why I love that song singing for a thousand generations. That we've been baptized into one body. The body, the big C, the body of Christ, the big church. No matter where you live, no matter what language you speak, no matter what ethnic, this, what, yeah, no matter what nationality you are, what, what class, ethnicity, that's it. So here's my challenge. We're going to do baptisms today. We're going to be doing baptisms once a month throughout the summer. And I can baptize you, and maybe you've been baptized. But when you're baptized, you're not, it's not just, oh, baptize me, and, I, and we never see you again. Paul talks about when you're baptized in the body of Christ, you are baptized as part of the body. You have a part to play. You have a job. You have a function. You cannot operate apart from the body. If I cut off my hand, my hand will die. 
That part dies. You were not designed to operate independently from other parts of the body. So you know what this speaks of me to? Not only are we aligning with Jesus' death and resurrection, not only are we submitting to, 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 the, to the law of Christ, which is to love others as the way Christ loved us, what, I, what it speaks to me is of community. That when I'm baptized, I'm being baptized. In, I'm designed to be a part of community. So if Shoreline is your home, even if you're watching online, if you call Shoreline your community, it's not enough to just be baptized. You've got to find your place. Because not only, again, are you submitting to the teachings of Jesus, not only are you identifying with his death and resurrection, but you're being baptized, or if you've been baptized, into community. That's why we push community so much. That's why we talk about these boxes, which we have men's ministry and the women over here and we have Bible studies and we got tribe up there and we got young adults, I think they're over there, 18 plus. See, they like to hang out in the shadows where they can make out. <laughs> you're like, I wanna be a part of that community. No, you're, you're 45 and married, all right? So you, you can make out on your own. That, because it's about being, a, when you're baptized, it's not just, it is identifying with the death and resurrection, but it's the time for you to be a part of a body because baptism is what unites us as Christ followers. It's what we all have in common. So let me summarize this. When you're baptized, you're doing three things. Number one, you're submitting to the law of Christ. You're saying, yes, I am going to love others the way Christ loved me. Number two, you're identifying with his death and resurrection. You're publicly associating. That's why we do it in public, to say, yes, I believe Jesus died for my sins and I am now forgiven. I can live a life eternally with him. And then number three, you're becoming a part of the body. You're not just baptized and then separate on your own. You're becoming a part of the body. So if you want to be baptized today, we're going to have some sign-ups over here. Actually, we're doing it once a month. Jessica's going to tell you more specifically. But let me just, before we pray, let me just imagine being a part of something bigger than yourself. Think about this. Men and women search their whole life trying to find significance of being, and usually it's a part, being a part of something that is bigger than you. That's bigger than just your job or your vocation. Men and women search for significance throughout history trying to be a part of something that's bigger than them. When you're baptized, you take your place with millions of other people that transcend time and generations across the globally and geographically as well as time-wise. We take our place with the people who've gone before us and the people who are here now and the people who've come after us. We take our place in the body, becoming one, carrying out what God's plans in the world. And it's something that we get to be a part of that's so way bigger than us. So if you've not done it, or you haven't, you know, you believe now and you, you know, you've walked away from God, whatever it is. In fact, if you have questions, walk up when you come up to the care. Is that where you're going to be? And ask those questions. But in a brief 34 minutes, that's what baptism is all about, Charlie Brown. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your word that it's actually so, it's not as confusing as people lead it, to, you know, say it is sometimes. But Lord, we thank you for your word. And we thank you most of all for sending Jesus Christ, your son, so that we could have eternal life. In fact, maybe you're here this morning and you've never put your trust in Jesus. Maybe you've never kind of heard it put this way. This is the way the Apostle Paul said. The Apostle Paul said in Romans that if you believe in your heart and you say it with your mouth, that's why prayer is important, that Jesus um, is the son of God and that he died for, on the cross for your sins. And now he rose and he rose from the dead and now he sits at the right hand of the Father. He says, if you'll believe that in your heart and say it with your mouth, it says that you'll be saved. And so that's why we pray a prayer that goes like this. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus and I want to give my life because I understand that Jesus gave his life that I might have eternal life. So this morning, I say with my mouth because I believe it in my heart. I don't know when it happened. Maybe it was today. But I believe that Jesus Christ truly is Lord and Savior. So thank you for saving me from the eternal consequences of my sins. In Jesus' name.